Hey there, welcome to the Yoga Better podcast. My name is Andrew Dugan. This is a podcast where we acknowledge the absolute stupidity of the name podcast while maintaining a straight face. Important life and yoga and business information with some chuckles to help the medicine go down. Today's episode, the second of three episodes devoted to running a business with your partner. My wife and I have been married for 10 years this year, raising four kids, inventing, promoting, executing, teaching, management, janitorial work, all of it. And yet we still like each other. She and I do a lot of talking today, so I'm just going to let the episode do the talking. Without further ado, go. Let's go. where we talk. Talk to Andrea. I'm making my eggs to this sound. This song, ready? My shoulders are so tired. <laughs> I'm sweating because of the hot flash, not because I'm hot, hot, hot. Okay. And start grabbing bacon with it. Okay. Like it looks like I have my eggs have eyebrows <laughs> and a very teeny tiny nose and no eyes. To be fair. To be fair. To be fair. To be fair. <laughs> Try it again. To be fair. To be fair. To be fair. To be fair. Uh, I don't know how to do it. Help me. How do I do it better? You wear all of our sofas. I just put a little smush mush. What the hell? The sock. <laughs> There's a sock in the towel. Oh, I forgot we have eggs to eat. <laughs> what... Oh, probably my favorite part of the day is the rain. Listening the rain. the rain, it was raining so much during the class, super loud. Both of my classes actually. Pokey pokey. What do you like about the rain? I like the way it sounds. Well, mostly it's a memory I have. I remember I had to be somewhere between seven and nine. And we had a carport and my dad would Mm-hmm. And I remember sitting in lawn chairs in the garage. So not under the carport, I guess, because I don't know why, but anyway. So we'd sit in lawn chairs, and we'd just sit there together quietly watching the rain, listening to the rain. And I remember that's the first time I ever had, like, an experience of God, kind of calm and quiet, listening to the rain. Thunder. Very sweet memory of my dad. He was, he sort of had the U-bald shape. I, I remember him with his does U-bald. That, does that mean when you look at him you say, you bald? Yeah, it does. That's what it means. Okay, so started a new school. I was worried about him. First day of school, I came home and he looked a little struck, like deer in headlights. I said, how was your day? He was like, it was good. I said, well, what happened? What was it like? And he was like, I've never heard so many cuss words in all my life. I don't tell anybody this, but what he really said, I've never heard so many cuss words, even more than daddy. <laughs> That's what he actually said. He so we were talking to Egon, and I was recounting that to him. And then Bodhi recounts some more stories. And he says that the kids were cussing a bunch at lunch. And he says, hey, 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 watch out, you guys. There are children here. I'm, I am the children. I'm the one you have to be careful around, cussing around me. And so they all laughed. I thought it was super cute. And then he said, so one of the guys was saying the F word, I guess. And he was like, why don't you just say fork instead? And so now he's training everyone around him to say uh, the good place, replacement cuss words, fork, shirt, asshole. <laughs> what's the one? What's the B one? 
Bench? No. Bench. Is it Bench? Mm-hmm. Yeah, just that's so funny. Instead of con- instead of conforming to it, yeah. he's like making a joke of it and laughable. It's like that's if I could have him react away, that would be it. And I'm so it makes me so happy to think about him because they're not thinking about it. They're just like being kids. But, you know, this isn't really funny. And I think we may have already said this before, but I just thought of it. So I was five years old. And my Uncle Kent is my parent, which in Cajun or French, it means your godfather. He had a bunch of horses. One of his horses was named Old Joe. And Old Joe was kind of like a camel-colored horse. He had a little white spot on his forehead. I was riding it with my uncle. I was on the back. My uncle was in the middle and my brother was in the front. It was Easter Sunday. Old Joe liked to walk under trees and branches. And my uncle Kent let me know that so that I would know to duck when he, when he told me to. And so we're walking along with the ho- on the horse and my uncle Kent says, duck. And instead of ducking, I picked my head up and I said, huh? A branch hit me in the face and knocked me off the horse. And I broke my arm on Easter Sunday. Got in the car. My dad was like, oh, she's fine. And my mom said, I don't think she's fine. And it turned out I was fine, but I did have a broken arm. I think it was my right arm. I do not remember. Say la vie. The two things we could talk about generally today are, first, why is it hard? Like, what are some of the pitfalls running a business with your lady friend? That's what I am? Your lady friend? Yeah. Like, if you're going to touch butts with somebody, how do you run a business? What are some of the pitfalls? And then acknowledging those pitfalls, and then what are some of our tricks? Tricky. Tricky. When I say, why is it hard to run a business with your husband, wife, partner, what comes up for you? Well, because they're not you, and they don't do things your, your way. They do their things their way. And Why is that annoying? I'm presuming it's annoying. I mean, it's in some ways, it's awesome. Please don't do some things like I do. But it's like having children clean your house. In so many ways, <laughs> it is... You're grateful, but... <laughs> I, well, it's... I'm not. I would rather just do it myself. Just let me do it myself. I'll get it done faster Plus, I don't have to hear you complain about it. But then they suck as human beings <laughs> when they get older if they don't learn how to do things like clean the house. And so it's kind of similar being in a relationship and running a business mm-hmm. that there's things that you do differently than I would do. Say, like, for example, for example, what? this is kind of not related to what I just said, maybe, but you ver- work very well. You work very well. You work very well by yourself. Right. And I... I like to talk a lot about nothing as I'm getting to the things to work on. And often that's annoying to you. <laughs> and so I really have to watch how many words are coming out of my face per minute. So this would be another pitfall. <laughs> so your first one is they don't do things. The way you do, uh-huh. sure. And then you have to then tiptoe around some things. <laughs> Well, yeah, because I don't, I'm like, I'm, because what has happened in the past is like, I'm, I'm super enthusiastic about something like, oh, this, 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 this. And then the next thing I notice, I've awoken the, the, what? the surly, you're interrupting me right. with unnecessariness. Like, oh, I totally was doing that. Yeah, you know, my perspective slash zoom out a little bit. Maybe one oh, way. Let's you... not, let's not give your perspective. I'll be too embarrassed. No, just it's. <laughs> You know, what's what's happening is we're in separate rooms. I'm working on something You're with headphones tell the on. You're going to story, aren't you? I'm just, this I mean, heaven, what story? This is so a thousand unfair. times. No, it's so embarrassing. No, but I I am not a worker by nature. I I'm good at fixating. I'm good at sort of focusing for long periods. But I'm not like a when things will when we talk about our tricks. Like and almost my entire teacher training is the collected stuff that I found that works that get your ass doing the thing you said you would do, right? I have to work on that. I have to get going on the things. If I don't, if there's a part of me that doesn't want to do them, it's hard for me to get going. And so when I'm in a state of flow and you come in and you want to talk to me about something completely unrelated, yeah, uh, sometimes that's annoying. It is, sometimes. (laughs) And I've gotten better at catching myself, but sometimes I don't. And then there's a moment where you will breathe a certain way or you'll like not look at me, but you'll change where you're looking ahead. And I'm like, oops, I did it. And I'm like, just let me tiptoe backwards out of the room. Okay. So maybe this is a good example of why it's hard. 
people work differently. And so if there's no structure for how to communicate, because there's problems we have to solve mutually, Mm -hmm. right? You need support. You need brain trust and sounding boards and feedback, or you just want to share just to like clear the headspace. But in your world, you would never have to schedule that. Yeah. But in my world, you have to schedule that. (laughs) You know, at noon, we have a meeting. That's totally, when we talk about our tricks, that's 100% one of the solutions we have. So our, the way we meet is hippie style. This isn't business formal. There's no rules of engagement. In the hippie world, we had some structure. I like meetings. I like what, I like talking. I like what they can accomplish. I, you say I work well alone. I'm good at it, but it's not good for me. And so I appreciate what meetings can give me because it's community and it's getting me out of my head and it's forcing me to use other people, but also be a resource for other people. That's, yeah, that's life is better when you're in community. And, and of course I would, outside of my family, I would never talk to anybody if I could get away with it. (laughs) That's why I'm talking to a mic right now. I'm literally like half the podcast, like we're sharing our lives with people, but what am I doing to create the podcast? Oh, bye. (laughs) <laughs> you want to be I'm just literally in a room by myself talking to a mic or in a room by myself recording music or in a room with headphones on listening to the results of said um, by myself isness by myself ness ness okay yeah okay okay got it by myself ness and yeah. some people are selfless I'm otherless <laughs> you are otherless <laughs> but I, anyway I love meetings and in the hippie world when we lived in Oregon we had meetings all the time. We'd have well-being meetings mm-hmm. where we talk, this housemate's got a problem with you and your stinky farts or whatever. Or it would, we have business meetings and it was nice to, to distinguish those, like money meetings, they would call them. Right. Uh, one of the things I have here is on our tricks is there's a lot, we do a lot of se- segregation separation. Like there has to be some borders. So for instance, uh, anyone who's ever run a business by themselves or owns their own business knows it is effortless to just always work on the business. You will never be done. Right. With the stuff that there is to do. So the first thing I think is super important to acknowledge, and there are some people that haven't gotten this yet, and you know if you haven't gotten this because you get pissed off when I say this. Uh Uh-oh. And it is whatever you do for a living, whatever you do with your life, your whole life, everything about as a husband, partner, whatever, as a parent, and then way more true as a business owner or employee or manager or artist, whatever it is you do, if you stopped, everything would be fine. (laughs) If I died today, everything would be fine. Yoga better might be totally fine without me, with you, right? But because we're the heroes of our own stories, we're the main character, we're the protagonist. So without us, there is no novel worth reading. The truth is, I don't care what you do for a living. I had one woman who, the last person to argue with me about this, uh, works with troubled people and suicide hotline and like, Mm -hmm. and she never got, the world will continue to spin without you doing that job because she would wear herself out. She's like super stressed. It's a stress, high stress job. And so the question I asked her and I ask all of you is whatever you think the world can't live without you, seriously, like all the way to your tiny children. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Uh, Have you ever been sick? So sick you had to lie down in bed for a few days. Like you couldn't get out. Like just those days disappeared. And when you came out of that coma, that altered state, did you still have electricity? Did you still have a house? Was there still like, yeah, everything went, all the kids got fed. Yeah. I mean, they might not have eaten for a couple of days, but like they're fine. They might've just eaten sugar. <laughs> They'll stay alive. That's right. <laughs> this is not saying you are not important and what you do isn't important. You can make a difference in the world if you did it. I'm not saying that at all. And I'm saying... This gives you the opportunity to not sometimes. And that and that is the thing that most of us miss when we start curating quality of life stuff. Quality of life has to be front center when you're talking about doing something with the person you want to spend the rest of your life with. Okay, statistically, you're not going to make it. They're going to leave you. I'm going to leave you. But we have this commitment, right? We're trying, right? If you start a business, you're not trying to say... What did you say last night? <laughs> Inguinal ligament. <laughs> Okay, sorry. Just for my, we're trying. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's how you know your your bitchy husband is an anatomy expert. When his, his single bitchy complains like I sit in queen of ligament. <laughs> <laughs> you just no apropos of no context. That, that should be is, funny to you. Yes. So <laughs> when you think about it, clear separations, there's separations of duties. Cute, poop, cute. Poop. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think we said the same I note. Think we, <laughs> doot, doot. I said. Yeah. Poop, poop. I said poop, poop, but we see the same note. Uh-huh. 
So you have certain jobs in the business. I have certain jobs in the business. We, that was up front, what I'm willing to do, what I'm not willing to do. We have switched mm -hmm. several times. Well, it'll sort of metamor Morph. metamorphose, but we're, it's not squishy. Who's doing what? One of us will start failing at a job. Then we can, we'll always reassess, but we reassess in these meeting times. Hey, I, I'm thinking you're not working so well. X, what about this? Here's a solution. Have you tried this? But the also clear delineations in work time. Like if, if technically we could be totally happy if we just quit yoga better, then it doesn't make sense to just slam our bodies up against the in, literally infinite bottomless bot amount, this pile of ever-growing problems of running a business. And so we solve problems as they come. We do the work we can, but then we actually curate time that has nothing to do with the business. Mm -hmm. If there's one, I don't have them like ordered of importance, but I think it's super important. We make agreements in our marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, if I say I'm going to do the dishes or I'm going to vacuum or I'm going to massage your feet or whatever, I'm literally saying, okay, you have a shit ton of stuff to think about. Don't think about that. <laughs> Yeah. That's mine to think about. And when we do that for each other, it simplifies our thinking everywhere. But if there's no not work time, I think that's the first thing that oh. can kill. And I think that's for you, that's probably the hardest of all the lessons. To stop? Yeah. Well, I mean, my thinking behind that is I, most of my time I don't. And so I have this feeling of like, when I get on a roll, I just, I'm trying to make up for all the lost time. And we talked before about you, your health. Uh -huh. We talked about menopause. How you'll we'll both grind. I think all human beings are we laugh prone, and dance. prone to grinding, bumping. Make coffee. Wait, that's a bumping is a different thing. Bump, you bump, then you grind. Yeah, you're right. Bumping and grinding, bumping and grinding, grinding and I'm bumping and grinding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you're better at that now. I am. I would say so. Would you say that the pandemic helped you with that? Um, like we just couldn't do anything? And so there was this, I mean, we've done this to each other. I've, I've had periods where I'm up till three in the morning working mm -hmm. on a project and you're pissed at me or in the early days bef yeah, before like you. A, I'm just like a little baby though, because I get mad, not because I'm mad. I get mad because you would get mad at me and you would put me to bed and then you do it and I can't put you to bed. It's like childish. But I would say that would be another, <laughs> that's a different thing. But you talk to your therapist about that one. <sighs> but you. But yeah. Well, that, I get frustrated, actually, sure. you would get frustrated. The main times I can remember that would ha that was happening was before we were really running the business together. Yeah. You were still fitness training before the teacher training, so you. Oh, that long ago, huh? I mean, that's what 2012. 2012 is when I began. 2013 is when I started videoing, videoing, and video editing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I had to, I was teaching myself Adobe Premiere Pro, and I would be up till three in the morning, mm -hmm. and then teaching seven a.m.s. And you would get, you, I'd see you because my desk was in this sort of corner, and so there'd be the light of my screen and the rest of the house would be dark and I'd watch a grumpy faced <laughs> hips forward foot slapping like shaggy do walk up and <laughs> you just do. with your hair kind of in your face and like you come to bed right now I can't believe it that's not what I sounded not like not at all it's much cuter but you were mad I am definitely pre-pandemic and maybe a little bit now but mostly pre-pandemic I would regularly say you fucking have to go to sleep now like you can't to yourself to you oh, yeah. like get off the fucking computer stop yeah, working on that like we're do. lying it like we're lying in bed like what stop it <laughs> yeah and the truth is everything you're working on is important enough to work on but not important enough to not sleep yeah if we have we actually set priorities when i talk about money my breakthroughs around money we sort of think about what i did to the business to make it work there's a universe called my commitments to yoga better in the business and the inventions I create and who I am as a teacher for my students, all that. But all of that universe operates inside a bigger commitment. Totally, right? So there's my commitment as a teacher. I show up on time, blah, blah, blah. But all of that is inside the commitment called you're going to feel better after class. Mm -hmm. Everything I teach lives in that bubble. But that bubble exists inside a much bigger context called I will provide for my family. And so anything that is great for yoga but makes my family starve, I'm not going to do it. Right. When we say quality of life, we sort of think of everything that happens in the business has to happen inside the bubble called we still maintain some kind of quality of life. Right. You know, we're maybe on the, since the pandemic, on the desperateer side <laughs> than we are used to or like. Mm hmm uh, although we've been here before as poor people pre, you know, 2009, even though we have these big commitments and we really believe in the business and there's, and every email that we could spend time working on and every idea we could chase down and think through and spreadsheet we could fill out and, and work on, its importance has to be overshadowed by other things. Children, ourselves, just like enjoying our lives. And one of the things I tell people, because of the way I teach private lessons, and you have this too now, 
Hmm. Maybe a little bit. How many couples do you teach? Actually, you don't teach any couples. You teach them teach independently. Them. Yeah, I do not teach them. But together, together no. It's, I teach. I I have a lot I've of people. A couple, I've had a couple couples come yeah. through, but. but this is just by dint of our pricing scheme. So I don't charge more for two. And so like, oh, we can do this thing together, and it ends up being this really sweet thing. But it's like I don't charge you more. I, there is a cost with my attention, but it's a thing that you guys can share together, and I'll make it great for both of you having things like that in your life is so helpful and they're not at the same level but they get to do this thing together mm -hmm. and share this thing you know go to lululemon together and whatever yeah. if i think about a relationship like i really like you now but if we think about our children our lives still pretty much revolve around the kids i have one kid in college I have a sophomore in high school, sixth grade and third grade. So there's there's a spread. Three quarters of them are still in school. They're still at home. There's just a lot of stuff to deal with with kids. When you have kids, your life orients to them. You're, you're steering in the direction of the kid's future rather than any particular, like your stuff has to either involve that and it's the, at least the way I live. And because it is very easy, especially if you're like a soccer family or a baseball family, football family, where there's just a lot of basketball activities. Mm -hmm. When do you make time for the thing to nurture the thing that manifested in a kid? Right. <laughs> right. There's a reason there's a kid present because there were two individuals that really liked each other and smushed butts. Okay. There was something that had you like each other enough to smush butts, but it is, I mean, with kids in the house, generally ha holding a crying baby is extremely stressful. Yeah. And Especially if your mothers have hormones that like make you want to nurture. Dads don't have that. Like, shut the fuck up, baby. Like, and everybody's sleep deprived, mm -hmm. especially if we're co-parenting. Like I could move into a new house <laughs> where dad went to go get cigarettes so he could get us. But we co-parent and we're sleep deprived. It's very easy not to invest in the thing that created the baby in the first place. Why do we run a business together? Because we like each other. We have, we share a vision enough that we can work on this thing. Except all of that was born from the kind of like that would have you smush butts with somebody. Smush, smush butts, butts with, with somebody. Smush butts with somebody. I want to smush butts with somebody. <clears throat> I want to smush my butt with somebody. <laughs> ba -ba -ba. Just somebody? Oh. I want to smush my butt with you, Andrew. <laughs> do <guess. laughs> I want to smush my butt with you, Andrew. Do and so we do that. There's separation. and We smush butts? Yes. <laughs> but we, we create time to cultivate the, the thing that would have you want to do that. Yeah, that definitely takes some. So, you know, for years, work. date nights, certainly finding things like, even if it's just watching a sitcom or practicing together or we're going to walk the park or we're going to exercise together in some way, ride bikes, play soccer, mm -hmm. right? There's... You have to curate it. It has to, re it requires your attention. It has n everything to do with the business because it has nothing to do with business. We're actually intentionally non-businessing our life. Yeah. Which enables us to then have a little bit more fuel to really devote as successful as we can be right. to putting our time and attention into the business. Yeah. I would say one of the things that really helps me with that, it was very true when the kids were little. I'm fine with just only being with the kids because I like them. But even now, as we're working on the business, part of what really, really helps me stop and take time to be with you is I just think about what I want our relationship to be like in 10 years. Right. And I mean, I can totally get how people grow apart. <laughs> it's so easy. <laughs> It is. I, I love our little moments here on this podcast. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, I, I really get I divorce. really get, I totally do. <laughs> I get it. But, but that isn't what I want. It's and in 21. What, it isn't what I want. And so it just, it takes, it takes, like you're saying, you're creating it. It takes creating it. You can see it too. I mean, you've been divorced. You know, you've been there. You've done that. You know, I don't know what it was like for you. I mean, I kind of know, but. I'm very imaginative. I can see. You know, say what you will about Jordan Peterson, which is mostly like, oh, yeah, it's silly dumbness wrapped in. I have some toe in philosophy and cognitive psychology. So because I think I understand the human brain, everything I say is grounded in a kind of truth. One of the things that I think has a has a following because of is he when you're creating heuristics for life, when you're simplifying so that you can have simple rules, he literally wrote a book called 12 Rules for you know, happiness for boys or something. I don't know. <laughs> Simplifications are always abstractions, but they're helpful. The target isn't a deer, right? But you work on targets so that if you want to shoot a gun or uh, point a gun or an arrow at a deer, 
you're going to be more accurate. And he had a good simplification. He says, look, if you want, if you want a helpful tool to get direction in your life, you need to give yourself permission to, to as free and open without judgment as possible, describe the life you want. Who could you be in five years if you were free to absolutely create education, partnership, communication, health, all of it. And that gives you that target. And then you spend the time and you look at all of your weaknesses, your blind spots, the thing, your bad habits, and now drive yourself off that cliff and imagine how bad it could be in five years mm-hmm. like, yeah. re- and paint it vividly, all your addictions, all your problems. So you got heaven on one hand and hell on the other. And you have the thing you don't want right there, the cliff you don't want to drive off right there, reminding you to constantly turn towards having those simplified things. Like if you don't acknowledge that the shit can hit the fan with a marriage, like we just moved into this new space of the Estonian, it is an objectively beautiful space. There are two or three problems with the space. And everyone hates this piece of art on the wall. But the degree they hate it is so not connected to reality. Right. It is pretty. Yeah. It, it's nice for the room. It just is hard to look at. So it, yeah. needs to be, it needs to be replaced. It's just a fact. It needs to be replaced. Okay, well, you're not tortured. This is still a fucking nice room. Yeah. What happens... We see this in the human body. This is what this is how I got people to reorient to mm-hmm. like quit fucking complaining about the room. Yeah. We're sitting in a beautiful room and there's two issues. How easy is it to fixate on the two issues and ignore everything else you have? Yeah. And so what I, I said, uh, does anyone have any experience with taking stuff for granted? <laughs> any, any and one person was like, oh, okay, just me and her. Okay, good. You the way this works in the human body is you absolutely take your knee function for granted until it's gone. Yeah. Until it's gone. What we're trying to do here is to be present. Mm-hmm. to like everything we have. Like the fact that your knees right now don't hurt. In the future, give me enough years, life will make your knees hurt. Your elbows are going to hurt. You're going to wake up with a crick in your neck next year at some point. Right. That's life. It's hard to appreciate the absence of a problem <laughs> because the way human brains work, it's just so easy to fixate on the problem. Mm-hmm. If I don't actually cultivate, like what I talked about with the poetry project, if I don't cultivate my appreciation of you and all that's beautiful about you and our marriage and all the things I like and have an eye on creating the stuff that I actually want rather than fixing on the stuff that I don't want, I literally am taking the most important thing in my life for granted and I'm going to drive it off the cliff mm-hmm. <laughs> because my eyes are on the wrong target. Yeah. I turned everybody around <laughs> right. in that class, but it's... People have basically been walking around angry. It's like being angry at the wall color. Like, this paint makes me angry. Like, the paint makes you... Don't look at it. (laughs) (laughs) Don't look at it. It's not... None of this is hard, but this feeling that um, you're being deprived or you create a problem. You have a little thing that's written on a whiteboard that's next to my desk now. It used to be next to your desk. It Mm -hmm. says it's not what what happens. happens. It's not what happens to you. It's what you say about what happens to you. Yeah. Welcome to the pun of the week or a month. I don't know how many times we're going to put this podcast down. So you made up a joke in class. Today. I haven't it? written it down, but I figured that. Okay, are you ready? I'm ready. What is the most thrilling place to put an ice cold drink in the summer? Where do where does one? Where does one? You put it on a roller coaster. Nice. People have to really understand the function of a coaster to get that joke. And it's funny, the more of those kinds of jokes you tell, you're really coasting. What do you call someone who's got facial hair and they're very strange? What? A beardo. <laughs> uh, did you hear that in France, the Ford Motor Company built a dome in honor of the Duomo in Florence? Mm-mm. And they actually built it specifically for film festivals. Did you hear about that? Mm-mm. It's uh, France's Ford Coppola. Nice. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> um, what kind of party will your, if your lower leg was to throw a party, what kind of party would it be? Shindig. That's right. Okay. Okay. If your foot was going to throw a party, what kind of party would it be? It'd be foot race. A toe down. <laughs> toe down. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I never go to those because my arch enemy always goes. Oh, nice. <laughs> Did you hear about the guy who crossbred bees and spiders? So oh. that Yeah, so that they could spin silk to have them fly patterns and create tapestries. Oh, this is a very good concept. I yeah, like it. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It was unbeweavable. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Thank you. I tell everybody they better be weave it. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of potato is the most enlightened? Mm, a potato? No, that one doesn't have very much money. Oh, it's enlightened. Its pockets are light. I guess so. You're right. <laughs> uh, wait, what was my joke? <laughs> now I can't remember. Is it a meditator? No. <laughs> But that would work also, but I have to make up a different joke for that word. Okay. Why? How? What? How? So what kind of potato is most likely to dress casually 
and be enlightened. What? A levitator. Levi Tater. A Levi Tater, that's right. What jeans wearing monk is made of potatoes? <laughs> What um, kind of root vegetable is most likely to have a quiet mind? Mm, root chakra. No, but that's also very good. Um, whatever they do, they do it gingerly. <laughs> I don't care what you're saying right now. <laughs> I don't care. <get> <laughs> <laughs> See, we, we got I don't remember the joke. I told. <laughs> it's too long ago. It was a meditator. Root, root vegetable. Has the quietest mind, a oh, meditator. A meditator, yeah. I had a guy pour a bowl of tomato basil soup on the side of my head the other day. You had a what? Do a woo? 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 You had a what? 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 I had a guy pour, a guy just poured a bowl of tomato basil soup on the side of my head the other day. Oh, that is uncomfortable. Yeah. He really, he was standing over me. He felt soup eerier. Oh, that jerk. <laughs> Seems a little ominous, eerie. Uh, some people say, uh, for fun, say the first letter of the alphabet. Uh, I turn away from them. Always. What? Some people love saying the first letter of the alphabet, and I always turn away from them. A is the first letter of an alphabet, mm -hmm. and you turn away from A. Mm -hmm. People who say it all the time, just robotically. A, 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 A. I'm going to turn, turn away. We call it rote A-shun. Oh, goodness. I thought that was the end of the joke, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm not getting this one. Punchline. Good. Okay, I think this one you made up, but maybe I did. What do you call it when a criminal poops in the middle of the room? No, I did make this one up. Okay. A centered. Centered. <laughs> he poops. He's mm -hmm. a center. Meditation will help you with that to really get you centered. <laughs> uh, why are people so directionless in Italy's capital? They're all Roman. I was going to say. <laughs> um, what do you call it when you have a knight that's super toned and he farts and they smell real sweet? What? Sir Rip. Mm, Sir Rip. So many levels to that joke. It's four. What do you call it when I count my trips to Rome? I tally. I don't, okay, good. I was like, tally. My friend from Sicily uh, sent, a funny, sent a funny photo. I see silly photo. Why are Hershey bars never on time? They chaco late. <laughs> <laughs> have we told my favorite joke? I uh, know we probably have, but I'm just going to tell it again. Tell it again, girl. What do you call a chocolate cow? A cacao cow. That's so good. What do you call partners in a chocolate company run by cows? <laughs> Co cacao co. Which chocolate has the most feminine pronouns? Her, or she. That's also that's very true. I never mm -hmm. thought of that. What do you call it when you don't allow anyone to party in your yoga better class? A, one of my classes. <laughs> A normal day in my. <laughs> Function. 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 So we're doing functional uh, no. movement, but it's also no. function. Yeah. No, it's function. Funct we we shun. Oh, I guess funky. Bio. Funky, funky shun. Okay, so this one was from one of the students in my class named Lawrence. Okay. Thanks, Lawrence. What do you call a group of old folks talking about their ailments? What? <laughs> this is from one of your classes. <laughs> <laughs> Organ recital. Oh. Good job, Lawrence. It's a good one. Our president's favorite Dolly Parton song about losing balance. Wait, what? What's our president's favorite Dolly Parton song about losing balance? Huh. Jolene. Jolene, Jolene, <laughs> Jolene. I don't know how it goes. Uh, when it comes to rug making, I believe in them. Nice. Is the continuation of the joke. Uh, that joke is always looming at a rug store. It's always looming? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I may have lost my thread on that. I mean, one second. Let me. Uh, uh, Wool, do you help me remember? I must ask you a question about that. I didn't quite get it. I must ask you. Must? I must. I must ask you. Yeah. Took a lot of mothballs to answer that question. Uh, did you hear about Bob Marley's brother who aged backwards? Mm -mm. He's been jamming buttons. <laughs> <laughs> been jamming on. Did you hear about the hive that wanted to do a performance about pastries? Mm. It was a biscuit. 
a biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> that was a biscuit. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Let's stay with bees for a little okay, bit. Okay, okay, we can stay with bees. So where do all the good bees collect? In the beehive? No, a beehaven. Oh, good. That's where <laughs> they go when they die, a beehaven. And then when they die, they go to beehaven. That's right. What bee's joint is the sweetest? What joint on a bee's body is the sweetest? I got to make the my butthole. joke better. <laughs> the butthole? <laughs> no. Is the that, honey. Oh, the honey. Honey. Especially if they're from ancient Mongolia. Attila? That would be a not sweet bee. Yeah. I love bug jokes. <laughs> They're pretty cute. Do you know what's a good defense? Fencing. Do you know what's not a good defense? Defensing. <laughs> 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 That's all I got. That was two. That was two. I'm worried I might go to jail. To jail? Mm -hmm. Jail. G E L. <laughs> That's not what I meant. I'm worried I might. I don't. So you can make this better. I'm worried I might go to jail. Mm -hmm. okay. Because. Because every morning when I eat breakfast, I'm a serial killer. You're a serial killer. I was <laughs> going to say you cry peas. You cry peas. <laughs> what? How does that make any sense? <laughs> peas? Like green peas? Yes, that's it. that's the cr image you had in your head of breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that's interesting. That's, that's a funny image. Well, I guess so. Yes, cries, it is. You, she cries peas. <laughs> peas don't take me. <laughs> Please leave me here with my family. Okay, what kind of bird is most likely to be on the second string of a kayaking team? Second string of a kayaking team? I don't know. A sparrow. Sparrow. What kind of bird is most likely to be a female rapper? Mm. Cardinal. Cardinal. What kind of bird is most likely to be a male rapper? What? Blue Jay Z. <laughs> <laughs> it is way funny if you could see her eyebrows. <laughs> Okay, what kind of bird is most likely to be uh, Milk's favorite cookie? Milk's favorite cookie what? Oreo. Uh, what kind of bird does King Arthur give the middle finger to the most? Hmm. A mo king bird. What kind of bird is most likely to make everyone uncomfortable? Pigeon. <laughs> <laughs> this is, eyes are weird. <laughs> His eyes are weird. <laughs> okay, you ready? What? Awkward. Awkward. What kind of bird ki is the nerdiest? What? Stork. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of bird can't fly straight? <laughs> what? A turn. <laughs> <laughs> That's too good. Uh, what, is, what is Queen Elizabeth's favorite bird? What? A nighthawk. <laughs> okay. There you go. Okay, I see you. Okay. All right. Uh, I thought of another one. What uh, was it? What kind of bird... Coughs up hairballs. Hawk a loogie. <laughs> what kind of bird can never figure out the person that's in front of them? Mm. An owl. <laughs> Who are you? Uh, what's a bird's favorite restaurant? Huh. Hooters. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so is it a male bird? I guess mm -hmm. females could like Hooters too. They got excellent chicken wings, man. <laughs> I mean, they I eat birds. <laughs> Owls eat birds. No, I was teasing because... I was like I, defending you go for the Hooters. Yeah, yeah you, like, you go for the. You, I really Andre go goes for to the, Andre goes to Hooters for the articles, <laughs> <laughs> and then afterwards, there's all this bird poop everywhere, and you say, "Who turds?" <laughs> <laughs> that joke is from one of Bodie's joke books. He laughs um, so hard on this. Why don't you see seagulls? Oh, okay, that's what it was. By the bay, because if did they be bagels? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, what What is the mascot of all umpires? What you're out. Oh, I was trying to think like umpire. Well, no, no, it would have been a bant. <laughs> Not a bird, but okay. Oh, yeah, you're right. It isn't a bird, but it flies. It does. <laughs> I've been having a lot of fun lately. A I've, bant. Two, I've had a couple of people like send me messages like, I cannot believe Bodie's 12 or I can't believe this or whatever. And I've been having very fun sending a picture, like an emoji of a clock and then like, Two or three flies, or time flies. Today, so a couple of my friends from college are all, we're talking about getting together, and everyone can meet on a certain date. We're waiting to hear back from this one person. And so I sent a drum, and then a toilet paper roll. For drum roll, like we're waiting to hear back from her. That's good.
so if we added some words to that sentence, it's not what happens to you that's the problem. It's not the environment that's the problem. It's the thing you say about it in your own head that is mm -hmm. that turns it into a problem when it's just a wall. We do that to each other. Yeah, of course. That's how marriages fall apart. That's how relationships fall apart. That's how businesses fall apart. Even when you start businesses with other human beings, like very few businesses, I just like businesses fail. The initial partnership is a kind of marriage and they almost always fail to some mm -hmm. degree. So one of them gets bought out, one of them gets fired, like one of them leaves, like from Apple to Microsoft to Facebook, all these famous, like the Whatchamadoodle brothers. That's, yeah, that's all relationships. And because I like you and I don't want that to happen, how can we make a difference in the world of yoga, the conversation of yoga? And just like when our youngest, who's about to turn nine, mm -hmm. crazily, in eight years when he moves out to go, you know, when we kick him out, if he's a mm -mm. bum, he's not going to college or if he's going to college and he moves out like, and it's just the two of us and 17 cats and dogs. Ew. Ew. Never mind. <laughs> 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 it's literally, it, I, we both see the future where it's going to be both of us, but it's something that we talk about. Yeah. And so who well, the hell are we going to be? That's, one of the, that's what I was going to say is that one of the things that really helps me and that before we were married, one of the things that I did is I would still, I would be with you, but I'd leave mentally. I would backtrack on what my commitments are because I really didn't have any. I wasn't right. clear about my commitments. I know that. <laughs> and <laughs> the thing that I do now with to the different commitments in my life is I don't mess with them. I don't question them. I don't like, well, maybe I should. There are some things that are worth questioning, like this whole thing, the whole argument now, like question everything, like probably not the best idea unless you're going to do some work to figure out the things that you're questioning. And so some things are worth questioning, but not all things. And so one of the yeah. things I don't question is, I'll question how are we doing or how could I make this better? But I don't question our commitment to each other. I don't question what we're creating. There's, and it's not like I can't, but it's just, that's not where, that's not worth my time right. questioning that kind of stuff. Some and people so, would equate that to faith. People use the word faith. I, if I don't use the word boundaries, I'm almost certainly not going to use the word faith. There are things that we have to start with a priori. So for instance, the question of whether you and I live in a computer simulation is probably not worth our time. Probably not. And the biggest reason is if we are, it's functionally the same and there's nothing you and I can do about it. And so although it's an interesting Mm -hmm. use of your time. If I can choose, if I'm, if I'm wanting to look for questions that are going to make a difference, we consciously start with a priori ideas like truth exists, we, reality is real. Mm -hmm. We can perceive reality through the, our meat uh, senses. It's distorted, but we can, through testing and through group, through testing through larger groups of people and through extra human sensory means, we can get closer and closer to this thing. We can agree exists called the truth even if we never find it. Right. Imagine uh, you want to work at Church's Chicken. What do you do? You don't have an audition. You have a... You have an interview. You have a... And... You have an interview. So they interview you. And so what is the interviewer's job? It's to ask questions up front at the beginning to see, are we going to let you work here? <laughs> And in the fu that doesn't mean in the future you're not being evaluated, but you don't go through that whole process every day with every employee, do you? No, you don't go through that process every minute of every hour of every day that that employee works there. Why not? Because the interview process creates an a priori context for the relationship to then happen in, right? A bubble. Mm -hmm. And you actually then give a person a chance to win or lose the game of good employee or agreements around their employment. I'll show up at this time, I'll you know, be dressed, I'll smell good, I'll be nice, whatever. I'll do my job, I won't call you names. There are things that will make you question our agreement. Sure. Of course, but in the absence of those things, the container has been set. It's right. testable, mm -hmm. we get curious about it. What most people mean by question everything is be incredulous. Right. And we've, I cannot, to me, just remembering the difference between incredulity and skepticism is so incredibly helpful. What's the difference? Incredulity uh -huh. is when you believe nothing. With how much evidence? No evidence. So you believe nothing with no evidence, mm -hmm. which is literally the same as believing everything with no evidence. Credulity. It's the same. So what's skepticism? Skepticism is... It's, you believe stuff because you have evidence to believe it. Skepticism? That's what skepticism means? I thought yeah, skepticism you look, was... You look for evidence, and if, there isn't, if there's an absence of evidence, oh, okay. then you don't that believe that sense. thing. I would not have said it like that, but that works. Yeah. If we're, if we're comparing definitions, mm -hmm. how are they related? There's a reason I believe the stuff I believe. Right. No faith is required. Now, intellectually, philosophically, yes, we start a priori. Right. Truth exists. Okay, great. That wasn't, that wasn't hard. 
Truth right. exists. Now, what do I have inside the context of the syntax of our language and, you know, that we agree that math is real? Right. <laughs> and if I poke you, you're real. If I cut me, do not do you not bleed? I mean, that makes sense. But that, I mean, that looked like two seconds to create an entire intellectual context for our lives to work. I made you these promises when we're married. I regularly fail at them. I, then I acknowledge my failures and I give you all kinds of reasons to just, just like, I'm just going to go with this thing that he's mm -hmm. worth it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not faith. It's it's a combination of trusting your path self, past self, but also just having some context to then operate in the rest of your life so you're not disassembling every part of your entire life always right. for incredulity. That's not skepticism. You have reason to operate inside the world you operate in. And you be curious about everything. Questioning and curiosity on the face of it seems different. When most people talk about certainly political questions, it's a, it's a, there's a question with a finger in your face like, you don't know the answer to this question. Right. How are you going to answer this amazing knockdown question? Which is very different than me asking you. Like there's a, there are these guys who go to college campuses to prove how dumb college people are. Oh, yeah. There's only two genders. Prove me wrong. I think it's a great conversation. I don't think it's like the most important conversation of our time. Right. <laughs> like there, I think when half the human race is oppressed by most of most governments in the world, when uh, the largest country in the world by far literally controls the flow of information and can poison entire populations. Right now, there's when a government can propagandize that the American government laboratory started COVID-19. Like, I don't think that's good for the world. Right. Or if you believe in climate change, which, you know, welcome to the podcast. If you don't, it's cool that you're here. Okay, what can we do about these kind of important questions? Does it mean we never talk about it? No. I love important conversations, but like the intensity of the, f the fever with which we argue with each other. I think we can actually just have conversations about this stuff. Like I would love, my favorite, my fantasy is that we're on a panel. You know, we got a couple yoga better teachers and then yoga and then teachers of all different stuff. And then good questions get asked you know, important yoga questions from their perspective, like what is enlightenment, <laughs> right? Which we don't really care about. And then other questions that we care about, like, okay, what is actually happening in down dog that has you feel better? Those are interesting questions to mm -hmm. us. And I would love to be in a debate slash conversation slash arguments. But if I ask a question to, to you, it's always going to be with curiosity. What do you have to say? I have read the same books you've read, but that doesn't mean anything. We're, we're trying to actually get closer to the truth. And if I assign, I think maybe one of the ways we could describe what you've given me is you've given me, you have just said with evidence, but you have just given me uh, the space to operate like I'm a trustworthy That's what source. I was going to say. One of the things that is, I don't know that I would call it commitments, but one of the things that I don't mess around with, I catch myself regularly thinking like I can't talk to you. And then I remember, oh, I can talk to Andrew. And then I re sort of assess or I look at our situation right there. And then often I can find a way to communicate something. And that is another thing that I would say would be something that's challenging about owning a business together is that we communicate a completely different. You're Mr. Facts guy. <laughs> Give me an example, time of day, exactly <laughs> what I said, and I speak in generalities. And that can be frustrating. Yeah, we, the thing we, I'm arguing we have about. our demons. Like you have said to me, I can't talk to you. I feel like that sometimes. Yeah, and that's a feeling. I know that's not true, but then when I say, hey, that's not true, that's not helpful. Uh -uh, that is unhelpful. <laughs> Uh, helpful tip for any gentleman <laughs> listening to this podcast. But, and so, okay, there's this truth things, but then there's communication. Mm -hmm. And communication isn't just, as Robert would say, a reduction of uncertainties that would lead us closer to some ultimate truth. It's a result, it's a reduction of uncertainties like you and I trust and know each other more. What is doubt? It's a kind of skepticism, but it's also a kind of cynicism. So what is giving somebody the benefit of the doubt? Benefit of the doubt? Yeah, it's, it's just, you're free of my doubt for this thing. I really think you don't listen to me, but I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. And so that's, we are good at that and that we give each other chances, especially when I know uh -huh. you're full of shit or whatever. Right. And that's relationship stuff, but that's true in every business, right? We have to, businesses are made up of human beings. The way Robert, the way Robert would have put this, I think I shared this in a previous podcast. It feels true-ish. I don't believe this is the actual mechanism, but it sort of directs us to an experience that I think is true. Robert used to say that, remember my teacher, Robert Bustani, lives in a world where cosmic, spiritual, psychic energy is real. And so what happens when you're with somebody for a long time, you live together, you cuddle, you hold hands, you talk, you're, you literally share a space. Your auras are sort of mixing, your energies are mixing. And from his perspective, energetically, you sort of become the same person. Like your uh, women will become in sync, mm -hmm. right? We become in sync with each other on a, on a vibe level. <laughs> 
that's not actually happening. But what does happen, but his then description of what happens from that does feel true. If we are energetically the same person, if you get upset, it's like I'm upset and it's mm-hmm. intolerable. For sure. I think the actual I think the actual mechanism for that are more subtle. They have to do with our relationships with parents and our our, prox- our relationship with ourselves for mm-hmm. sure. How comfortable we are we are with failure and how we do with when people are so proximate. And we're, we're we spend so much time together. I am absolutely guilty. I am so much nicer. Like if, I, if I'm in a dark place, I can I can walk into that classroom and just be the nicest actually be the nicest person right. in the world it actually this brings us actually back i think to what we started with with taking for granted yeah to me that's a symptom of taking your situation like you're the person you're with yeah. your environment for it's granted. just, like it's just a, so it's, easy to do it's like you are part of a, a, a fake program in my head yeah all and, this is just playing out in my head and so if i mean to myself i mean to you well yeah and there's this whole like uh, fundamentally from what I understand about human brains is that everybody for the most part is really, really good at, at finding what's wrong. We have like an eye out for finding the problem because then we can fix it and then we can stay alive to survive. So it sounds like when you put your eye out. Oh, keep your eye out. Let's put it back in. Ew, that is gross, but thank you. My motto, it doesn't matter how great you are when things are great. It matters how great you are when things are really hard. Right. For me, what I found the best way for me to stay present to that stuff and to continue to be great, not only with the people in my life and especially with myself, is staying connected to the beauty of it. That, that is a skill, not taking stuff for granted. And just you, just like with breathing and with posture, you assume the game is to be a skeptic. Even when you think you're standing up, even when you think you're breathing, like, yeah. are you really like, have a, just a healthy dose of that in there? Are you operating from... You have reason to disbelieve that you're operating from an empowered perspective yeah. all the time. Oh, yeah. You have excellent evidence to show you that if you think you're sitting upright, you're definitely not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so those things, you have reason to be skeptical. You have reason to like pay attention. And those, of course, human brains do not want to pay attention. Uh-uh. We don't want to spend any freaking calories on that. And I so love it takes that. time. I love that. That's a very helpful tool that I feel like I've reconnected with recently, how our brains are designed for survival and to spend the least calories possible. So for you to change your habits, for you to sit up tall, for you to take a deep breath, for you to it, or learn something new. It's expensive. It's expensive. Which yeah. it literally endangers your life. Yeah. Except in the context of grocery stores, that's our job is to grow. It's all, it's, it's the, it Did is. Did you say in context of grocery stores? We have grocery stores. We're not going to starve to death. Oh, and then you said grow. And I was like, was that a pun? He just slid know. in there. I didn't see a smirk. There was no evidence of a joke. <laughs> in some ways, it's our duty that we, we have the, when you grow from grocery duty. stores, you duty. <laughs> Given that all of our ancestors didn't have this option. We have this option. It's expensive, but it's not going to actually kill us to spend these calories that might n- we might need in two weeks if we inter- enter some kind of starvation situation. So I definitely take you for granted sometimes, but I feel like I'm in a period where the two percent of the time really enjoyed you. Obsession of the week is photography. You know, I could just like look at you for a living. You know, if anybody wants to like Patreon me, <laughs> it's three hundred k a year. Just shoot it my way, and I'll just stare at my wife. I like it. Three hundred k money's I, rolling in. I like you too. Yeah, I feel like I've gotten so much better at in perspective on how one. Wonderful you are. Just re- actually, this last week, yesterday actually, we were doing big paper thinking, and I had this idea that I would, in some ways, support Andrew. And the thing he does for me and with me all the time, where we get down and we write down everything and create something. I didn't communicate it well. It was not a success as far as what my experience was. So I went from being happy and gregarious to like. <laughs> Uh, introvert, disappointed, frustrated with myself. I remember you said something like, don't let this ruin your day. And I couldn't make my face match what I was thinking. (laughs) What I was thinking is like, I'm not going to. I know you're doing the best you can. I know it's not your fault. Like I've been really, really good. And then we tried again and it was better. It's much, much better. I was talking to one of the participants about relationships and she and her partner are together and they're, they're, her partner has children. They're not married. Right. And then how do you become a step parent? If you're not married and you're not really a step parent, you're sort of like a co-parent, this kind of thing. And we had this whole conversation about how it requires some falling down. There's not anyone who says there's a book on how to parent as a parent or a step parent. There's not an A plus B equals C situation. Right. You have to figure it out as you go. Every parent does. Either you have 
have your child from when the, the time they're born as an infant for however many years, you know, there, there's a like 16 years, let's say, you're growing as a parent to a 16 year old, like all those years, and someone comes in and they start to parent to, well, there's, it's not any different. Right. It's the same thing, except you're just learning to love and parent a 16 year old instead of an infant. Right. And you grow as a parent. You're not the same parent to a two year old as you are a 16 year old. You aren't. And yeah, exactly. And so every you stage. Invent yourself. Yeah. You just have more resentment and back pain from having <laughs> held them. <laughs> That's right. And you know, like it's, it's one of those things I had, this has happened so many times where I finally get it. Uh huh. Like, I'm finally, okay, we got this going. Nice. And then they can walk. <laughs> <laughs> and then they can start going to school. And exactly. then they, like, there's just, like, always a next thing. And so just, like, all the things that we're working on, there is a final moment where you're done. As far as we're concerned, this is not right now. If you yeah. can hear me talking, if you're listening to this podcast, it's not time to be done. And so there are some things that get finished. But when this kind of stuff, like, growing in your relationships, whether you stay in a relationship or not, you're still having, you're still going to have to deal with yourself and grow it's hard to let go of an end place right it's like i'm desperate to be to the end even with our business i'm desperate to be there both you want to achieve you want to be happy with what you've achieved and not let it go and everybody wants that they're there yeah i want to they're there and there's no they're there they're there to that i say they're there to that i say goodbye you gotta go okay thank you love you i love you okay bye-bye They call him obsessed, give him time to be best He'll always learn something new, he puts the two into I inherited photography. My father was, from an early age, captivated by it. And judging from all the photos of his family, they were also obsessed with photography. So when he got out of the house in his military service, he purchased a small, medium-format, twin-lens reflex camera during his leaves in Japan. It was a Yashica 44LM, brand new. Where most medium-format film cameras are 60 millimeters wide, this one used a 44 millimeter wide film. While taking photos from a foxhole, a piece of shrapnel hit the camera, breaking off the light meter and cracking the viewfinder. As a kid, I played with this camera as a kind of odd relic of a bygone era. When I was 14, I showed interest in cameras, so my father showed me the ropes, walking me through exposure, shutter speed, ISO, and focus. Those are the four fundamentals of getting good photos. After a year, he loaned me, gave me, his Canon AE-1 program with a great 50mm 1.2 lens. And from the 10th grade on, I literally carry this camera on my body every day. I shot something like 20 rolls of film a month, which is super expensive, and got my film developed in Walgreens. In lieu of making the art department, let a musician join the darkroom classes. It was convenient. My father, all the while, was still taking pictures. But now, with an Olympus digital point-and-shoot. It was during this period he became infamous for candid, way-too-close flash photography of every event. I was blind for much of this period from his picture-taking style. Photography is many things. Shockingly easy, really the easiest of all art forms. Oh yeah. Does it tap into some deeply satisfying human appreciation for capturing visual moments? Yes, again. Amazing at documentation and assisting in our tendency towards nostalgia, trying to hold on to moments? Oh yeah. Does it abstract and distort reality by cropping out most of life, putting the focus on an unnaturally small subject? Yes, again. Does it create unhealthy habits of framing, objectifying, and socially distancing the photographer from its subject? Oh, yeah. For sure. And yet, fundamentally, I am drawn to visual images. This urge of mine, this preference, I admit, is quite primal. Photography simply allows me to flood those parts of my brain in a most satisfying way, much like cocaine, I suspect. As a matter of fact, if I could just photograph my wife part-time and then rifle through old photos the other half of the time, I would definitely quit yoga today. Yesterday, really. No question. I went digital myself in 2003 with the purchase of an Icon D70 and a nice lens purchased with some of the money from selling my double vase. From that point on, most months I took about a thousand photos a month. The hard drive holding that period of my life pre-2010 is
minus 4 terabytes. Not bad for a 16 megapixel camera. In 2016, my father began having health issues and spent some time in and out of ICUs. The next year, he was going to have his 70th birthday, and I had a great idea. Go through all of his photos, turn them into albums for the first time, but then refurbish his Yashica from Vietnam, search out and find the only remaining manufacturer of 44 millimeter film on the planet. Take photos of the whole family, develop and print those photos, and put them at the end of the big album of his photography with his camera. Much like Hasselblad, the pictures are square. If you think of what a 35 millimeter camera, the, the normal film camera, it's a rectangle. You can have a portrait or a landscape. With the square, it's just a square. And so you never turn the camera. You're always looking straight down through the camera into the viewfinder, taking the picture vertically. And so going through his pictures was actually quite easy. Where are all the square photos? He had hundreds. This project led me to taking film photos again, but this time in a much more serious way. I learned all those details of every element to control for film, and of course I learned how to develop film for the first time as a nearly 40-year-old. I now shoot on six different cameras and three film formats, 35 millimeter, medium format, and 4x5. This also led me to one of the oldest photo printing methods, platinum palladium printing. I am now one of the few, if not the only, practitioner of platinum palladium and chrysotype printing in Houston. And prints made in this way are said to be in perfect condition for a thousand years. You can't hurt them with UV light because they're made with UV light. If you know anything about collecting photography, you know that if you want to hang a photo in your house, you have to have museum glass that protects against UV light, platinum palladium, Chrysotype, which is printing with gold, and cyanotype, blue printing, are all made this way. Photography is the art I have done the longest uninterrupted, music being put on hiatus for almost 20 years. My relationship with it has changed many times over those now 30 years. With phones making it nearly effortless to create beauty, I now rarely reach for my handy 50 megapixel Sonys. Yet one of the surprises has been my renewed love for film. It slows you and your subject down. The capture is ruinable in dozens of ways, so more care and attention are needed at every, at every step. And until you develop and scan it, it is literally erasable or losable. So why go all through that trouble? Well, of course, craft. Like the slow food movement, slow creations are a beautiful thing on their own. I love how when you hold a negative, you are looking at the imprint of that moment. Photons that bounced off the surface of your subject created a chemical reaction on the surface you now hold. And in a sense, some of their past self is preserved and tangible. One of the reasons I love old photos, and I could go through them all day, is I will never know my older clients in the past. I can't have a conversation with them when they were 40 while I am 40. My 40-year-old self cannot slide back into time, but I can peer deeply into a photo of them, of anyone, and my 40-year-old self can do the work to imagine everything about that moment. For those hopeless romantics like me that enjoy the bittersweetness of nostalgic reminiscences, what a delight. That's the Hasselblad sound. ever have any questions, need support, this stuff is hard. We're always here. People in the community know that you stay after class. We'll talk until your question is answered. If you don't live in Houston, Texas, you're always welcome to swing on by. Just a short plane ride. You just need to COVID test and all that. But if you didn't know, andrew at yogabetter.com. You can always reach out. This podcast was produced in Houston, Texas by the world-renowned Sarah Bellum and myself, Andrew Dukoff.